Hello, and welcome to Repro Film Festival by Mama Film. I am Debbie Samples. I'm Leela Meadow Connor. And I'm Mallory Martin. As the founders of Repro, we want to thank the village of people who have made this festival possible our filmmakers, special guests, partners, sponsors, and of course, our audience. You have lent your time, talents, and expertise to help amplify the voices that are so crucial in the fight for reproductive justice and bodily autonomy. When you purchase tickets and donate to Repro, you've become an active participant of change as all net ticket sales and accompanying donations support our five beneficiary organizations. We thank you for participating in these vitally important call to action conversations and hope you leave feeling empowered to be your own advocate in the world. Please keep women's reproductive rights at the forefront of your mind as we enter this critical election season. We're pleased to present the legal sterilization call to action conversation moderated by Jeanne Epps of Black Women's Health Imperative. Hello, and welcome to Repro Film Festival's Illegal Sterilization Call to Action Conversation, a conversation to expose the history and present day status of illegal sterilization in America. My name is Jeanne Epps, and I am the Special Projects Manager, as well as the MSK Program Director at Black Women's Health Imperative, as well as, well as the moderator for tonight's conversation. I am joined now by an incredible group of individuals. Erica Cohn, the director of the feature documentary, Belly of the Beast. Angela Tucker, the producer of Belly of the Beast as well as Kristen Marquez, the producer of Belly of the Beast. To those of you watching and listening in, feel free to ask questions along the way using the Q&A portal, and we'll do our best to answer as many as your questions as we can by the end of this conversation. So let's get started. I just want to start off by saying, wow, just wow. What a powerful film developed and produced by a group of amazing women. For many, this may have been their first introduction to what reproductive justice, reproductive injustice looks like, excuse me, within the prison system. I like to quickly just lay the foundation for reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. Reproductive justice is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. And what we've seen within this film is happening within prisons and within our communities, reproductive injustice. So Erica, Angela, and Kristen, how did each of you come to this work? Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'll start. I was first introduced to attorney Cynthia Chandler, who you meet in the film. In 2010, we were introduced by a mutual friend and I was really inspired by Cynthia's compassionate release work. You know, she had represented some of the first terminally ill people who were granted release uh, from prison in California. And I was also really intrigued by Justice Now, which was at the time, one of the only, if not the only US organizations with board members currently in prison, kind of leading strategy and working collaboratively with those in the free world, really from the inside out instead of outside in. And I was very much taken by their Let Our Families Have a Future campaign, which exposed the multiple ways that prisons destroy the basic human right to family. One of the most heinous being the illegal sterilizations, which really screamed eugenics. It was happening predominantly to people of color inside prison. And Cynthia invited me into the organization as a volunteer, which I later became a volunteer legal advocate providing direct service needs for over 150 people inside California's women's prisons. And from really there, I began working collaboratively with people inside on a project that became Belly of the Beast. And as you also um, have an opportunity to meet in the film, Kelly Dillon. And I had really heard about Kelly Dillon's powerful activism through my work at Justice Now, though I didn't really have a chance to meet her until a few years into the filmmaking process. And after Cynthia connected us, um, Kelly and I began working collaboratively on a variety of projects, including Belly of the Beast. And the more that I really learned about Kelly's experience as a survivor, 
her courage and selfless advocacy for others, I really felt that the film needed to center around her story. As we reveal in the film, you know, Kelly's discoveries really catalyze Justice Now to begin investigating the illegal sterilizations in prison through which we meet other survivors. Thank you. Angela or Kristen? Well, Kristen, maybe you go next because it's like chronological. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chronologically, I came onto the project um, in about 2012, I want to say. Um, and uh, I was first introduced to this, um, you know, world of illegal sterilization. And when I first heard about the issue, you know, I was introduced to it um, through Erica and this project that she was working on. And I happened to be in North Carolina working on um, another project. Um, and she just needed somebody to go and, and do some legwork on the ground in North Carolina as far as um, talking with other journalists who had been um, a part of a major push in North Carolina um, to work on reparations for women who had been illegally sterilized. Um, and that was how I was first introduced to the work of uh, Justice Now and, and the issue of uh, sterilization for people inside. And they, uh, I mean, I think when you first hear about this, when it is the first time you hear about this issue, it's incredibly shocking. And I think from that, I, I was just like, this is something I wanna help and be a part of as much as possible. And um, that was that was my first introduction, and it's been quite a journey since then. Yeah, and then I came onto the project. Uh, I guess it was three, a little over three years ago. And um, but when I think about my exposure to this issue, I would say, as a black woman, I've heard about sterilizations occurring, but I don't think I really understood that it was sterilization exactly. You know, you've heard these anecdotes about um, these kind of surgeries happening to women, like the tubal, the tubal ligation happening to women and, and, and having a sense that they didn't really give their consent for the tubal ligation to happen, but it was kind of like, well, this is just what you do. And so I've, I've, I've heard anecdotes um, and it wasn't until working on this film that I really understood that what happened in the film uh, is kind of part of a larger, a much larger issue. Um, so, but what was happening in California was completely new to me until I met Erica and, you know, at that, when I came on, there was, you know, stuff to watch and to, uh, to see, and, you know, so I watched the footage, I saw Kelly, I knew it was an incredible story, and I wanted to really play a part in bringing her story specifically to to the floor. Thank you, ladies, for that. Um, uh, I think I can say this, and I think everyone else who watched the film, you know, we really appreciate you for working together to produce this film that, you know, opens up people's eyes around the world to things that, you know, is, is happening simultaneously as they're living their lives, but that's something that they're not really putting their focus on. So I appreciate you guys for bringing that to the forefront um, and really providing that story. So, you know, from 1909 to 1979, California law explicitly authorized state institutions to sterilize people who they deemed unfit to reproduce and coercively sterilized over 20,000 people, 20,000 people. Throughout the 20th century, over 30 states had eugenic sterilization laws, and nearly one third of all of those forced sterilizations in the US, they were performed in California. And until at least 2013, um, California was still sterilizing people in women's prisons. So Angela, I read a quote from you and it said that this is an open secret in communities of color. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think, yeah, it's partially what I, 
what I was talking about earlier is this notion of everyone has kind of heard an anecdote. Um, and I can't speak specifically about California, though I'm sure um, it's the case there. But if you're a Black woman, you've heard an anecdote about another Black woman getting some kind of process, be it tubal ligation, be it a hysterectomy, that um, they didn't give their consent towards. And so that's why I called it an open secret because um, when I heard that this was happening in prisons, it wasn't like my mind was like, I mean, I don't understand how, you know, when you said earlier the, the, the phrase deemed unfit to reproduce, uh, we all know who that term, what kind of person that term is talking about, right? And um, if you're in that community, um, you, you know, you've had conversations about your reproductive health that have been um, inappropriate, limiting, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that it goes as far as a forced sterilization was, is not really a shock to me or I think to a lot of brown women. I agree with that. And I mean, if, when we look at the data that's around just about what happens to Black women and other women of color when they access the healthcare system, how they're treated, the services that they receive, the services that they don't receive, mm -hmm. um, the lack of health literacy and the lack of compassion from the providers to really provide that support mm -hmm. as these women are seeking care through the system. So I think um, this is really huge in terms of what that means for other women um, outside of the prison walls and what it really means for them inside the prison walls because it's a little bit different in terms of how they access those services and what they can and can't, you know, what they can refuse. But then it's also about are these women, you know, how are they empowered? Are they educated about this? You know, what, what are their rights inside of the prison? So, you know, this open secret piece is just like, with everything else that happens in communities of color, it's like we know what's going on. Um, it's still systems, it's the systemic racism, it's the things that we've dealt with um, all of our lives that impede our um, access and full autonomy to receive respect and the services that we deserve. So I, I want to pose this to all of you. Why was it imperative that your team use the power of storytelling and film to tell the story of Kelly and other women who experienced this? Kristen, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think Kelly is just an amazing example and advocate. And, you know, I think one major thing about this film is showing that there is a, a future, there's life beyond um, incarceration and really highlighting, I mean, absolutely this film is about a terrible thing that happened to Kelly, but even more so it's about where she launches from. And I think that that's, um, you know, and that's the power of the storytelling of this film um, and I think that's what has kept, you know, uh, Erica going for all the time that she's been involved in this and Angela. And, you know, this has been quite, quite a push, <laughs> quite an uphill push for a long time um, for this film. And it's, it's incredibly exciting to see it coming out in a time um, where it can bolster Kelly in her future work and, um, and fit into um, a culture where, you um, maybe hopefully now and continuing forward, it's gonna be more receptive to this type of um, perspective on, on what's happening in vulnerable communities. Yeah. And so how long have you guys, how long did it take to really get Belly of the Beast produced? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a, a 10 year in the making journey and you know one of the um, one of the most difficult parts of making this film is that there's a tremendous level of secrecy 
and privacy these institutions hide behind, it's incredibly difficult to uncover these abuses of power. And so, you know, as we're witnessing population control, modern day eugenics and systemic racism through policing, through imprisonment, through lack of access to health care, you know, that um, uh, it was imperative for for us as a filmmaking team to really ensure that we were uncovering the full depth um, and to be able to clearly relay both the filmmaking part of it, um, the kind of full character arcs, but also the reporting process. I mean, in, in the process of, of making this film, we calculated that between California State Audit um, and prison records that nearly 1400 sterilization procedures occurred between 1997 and 2013. And um, since 2014, California has been required to report the number of sterilizations performed each year and kind of prove medical necessity around each procedure. And our team also wanted to uncover, you know, to what degree this was happening in other states. You know, California um, is, is just one example. And so our team sent a Freedom of Information Act requests to dozens of states across the country and discovered that only six states have banned sterilizations. Five states allow for medically necessary sterilizations. Three states still allow sterilization procedures. And all the other states either didn't respond to our request or declined to, provi to provide information or stated that they had you know, no policies that would have been relevant to our request. So in speaking with other organizations around the nation who work with people in women's prisons, we know that sterilization abuse is happening, but we don't know to what degree. Yeah, I just need to follow up to something that Erica said, which is um, um, just a clarifying point that sometimes I make with people, which is there is, you can get sterilizations. Like people get sterilizations, they get you know, um, hysterectomy, tubal ligation, they, those, you can provide consent to have those happen. But what we're talking about is this notion of forced sterilization, right? And so then it makes you ask this bigger question, uh, which we talked about throughout the making of the film, can you gain consent in prison? Um, and which we feel the answer is no, uh, in these settings, right? So, um, Kelly says something that's very profound to me that I think about all the time, which is uh, it's not like she could go and Google something, get a second opinion. You know, when, when someone says to her, okay, this is what needs to happen, that's just what's going to happen. You know, it's, um, there's no way to get any more information as to whether or not these are the things that should or should not happen. It's just kind of, this is what's gonna happen to you and you can stay, stay in pain or not. You know, there's no middle ground. So, um, so I just sometimes I just want to cl clarify that because it's it's really hard for people to imagine what situation Kelly is in and people like Kelly are in, um, and that's that goes back to the story of tell the power of storytelling piece, which is trying to create a film that, to the best of our ability, can recreate what that experience is like. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Erica, I think I saw a quote from you that said you wanted to reimagine how we view imprisonment. So can you talk about that? Like what what has been the response to this film? I, I believe you guys um, showed this at the Human uh, Rights Watch. So what has been the response to that and how um, do you think that you have succeeded your goal of re having folks reimagine what imprisonment looks like in terms of sterilization and um, reproductive injustice that happens within those walls? Prisons are just so far out of our minds and out of our consciousness. They're so far from our physical reach. The, you know, we're rarely granted access to worlds behind walls that aren't dramatized or sensationalized. So when I say that I really wanted to imagine how we visualize imprisonment, I wanted to use imagery that really evoked memory, passage of time, really contrasting freedom and confinement, and very carefully wanting to viscerally 
place viewers within these intimate, vulnerable, uncomfortable spaces in prison. And um, our filmmaking team didn't have access to some of those spaces and so therefore chose to carefully reconstruct um, some of those moments which were really in collaboration with um, those whose stories we were telling. You know, we tried to reconstruct agonizing over every little detail, feeling the weight of responsibility and gravity of accurately depicting that time, that place, that memory, that moment, each restricted space. And I feel in some of the conversations that have happened since, the, since our first uh, Human Rights Watch Film Festival premiere that um, we've gotten a lot, of, a lot of feedback from people that said, either who were incarcerated and said, wow, this was so accurately depicted, mm -hmm. um, or people saying, I never really viewed prison in that way, or I never really understood what, what it could um, look and feel like um, in that way. So. Yeah, I think um, for me in the film um, that um, part of the film where the, the doctor, the woman there in the exam room in prison and the doctor is like eating, you know, and, you know, didn't wash his hands or have on the gloves or, you know, didn't change the little paper that's on the table. And it's just like just seeing that I'm just like, are you kidding me? No one in that place, no one stopped to say like, this is not right. This. I mean, because I know if I were to walk into um, a doctor's office and that be the case, there would be a problem. And I would advocate for myself. One, I probably would just leave. You know, I would raise a little bit of hell because I do not want this kind of service. But I'm thinking about, you know, as I watch the film, thinking about those women who are in there and how could they even oppose that? You know, how can they use their voice in the sense if if that's all they're going to get, right? That's the, that's the type of care that they're going to get. And so, um, you know, as you guys worked with Kelly and other women who have shared their stories, you know, what were some of the thoughts um, from those women for that scene? Like, what was their reaction um, for those who may have experienced it or who may have not? Because I know I, that angered me. <laughs> Um, I think that some of the reactions um, from those who, from people who have been placed in similar situations is that it can be very, very triggering, very raw, very real, because they, um, the way that we shot everything was so much in collaboration with um, people who had experienced this directly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the shots that you're talking about, even the, the there's a series of shots where people are sitting on the exam room table waiting for a pap smear and all you see is um, legs dangling from the from the table. And that's a, that's that's a moment that a lot of us can identify with and um, placed within a coercive environment where your mere existence is dictated by force. You are under constant threat of force. And um, I think that one, you know, really, it really helps set the stage to what kind, as Angela mentioned earlier, that, you know, that notion of consent, how can it be possible within these coercive environments? And also, you know, very universal experiences that all of us have had and in, in seeking, seeking health care to some degree. Yeah, um, I know there were uh, plenty of moments within the film where I know um, a lot of us thought to ourselves like, wow, I, I, I can't imagine if that had happened to me as I'm, you know, accessing healthcare um, and interacting with a, a physician or interacting with a nurse who it's supposed to, and these are um, healthcare officials who take an oath to do no harm. Um, and they're doing harm in these spaces by not respecting the women who are receiving those services, not respecting their right to give consent, not coerce consent, but consent to these services. And the right to know, I think in one part of the film, um, she couldn't even access her records. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem when you think of folks trying to take control of their health and empower themselves by having all of their information and just not being able to access that. 
Um, so have you guys heard about other women who have had that trouble of not being able to access their um, health information or it being inaccurate when they do access it? Yeah, from my work as a legal advocate, um, as a volunteer legal advocate, there were dozens of times that um, I was requesting medical records on someone's behalf where information came back like totally blank, you know, and it took um, like there was just pages and pages of blank papers and it maybe took, you know, 10 different requests to actually get the accurate information. Um, and you know, there's, there's a tremendous barrier to accessing medical records in prison because of costs too. Um, and so one, if you're not given access to your medical records because of costs, you actually have to pay per copy uh, each, each paper you're paying for in addition to getting a, a total runaround where you're not able to actually get your medical records in hand because you're sent blank pages or you're told to go to someone else um, that even as a legal organization advocating for someone having trouble. I mean, that says, that says a lot um, to the barriers that one has and being able to, to have um, information and be able to, to make informed decisions about um, you know, some of the most intimate parts of one's lives, one's medical history, one's future. And I feel like you know, within the prison system, I mean, you could, it's within the prison systems, but it's really within um, the, the world at large, all of this kind of fake bureaucracy is created to keep people from being able to um, uh, access their rights, right? So it's like in everything in prison, you have to pay for every single teeny little thing. And um, there's a form for everything. And the goal for that is for you to just kind of like not lose interest kind of run out of steam around doing anything you know like it's like just you you have complete control because i don't want to deal with or i'm not able to i don't have anyone to advocate for me for the all of the various forms that i need to get basic care so um because you know a lot of the a lot of the women inside didn't didn't have um anyone to help them with it like cynthia uh was an incredible advocate and was able to tell all of these women, like show people their records and, and, you know, different people like Erica and other people like that were able to go in and show people their records. But a lot of people don't have advocates like that. And so they just sort of are like, well, like whatever you say, and that's all kind of part of control. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that, kind of leads me to um, the status of Kelly and Cynthia's reparations bill um, to because there are women who to this day still don't know that they were sterilized. Mm -hmm. um, so if you guys can talk about that a little bit, um, just, you know, what has that process been like? Um, and, you know, how can individuals and organizations and other communities support um, this petition for reparations? Do you want to start, Angela? Oh, oh okay, I can start. You can chime in. Uh, sorry, that's where I'll like you, you talk. Yeah. To um, <laughs> that's why there's all these pauses. Uh, well, um, we are working with uh, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice and CCWP. Um, uh, and, Kel and Kelly has been very involved with this and Cynthia has been very involved in a reparations bill in California. Uh, and it's a petition that I'm, I think we can share with folks so we can figure out how to share that with people at large to sign. And that would be to provide reparations for women who were forcibly sterilized in California. Uh, so that bill, that petition is still going around and it's still, we'll, we're still waiting for, um, you know, the moment when that's gonna be discussed and considered. So we're just kind of gathering more and more people to get behind that. Um, Erica, any other updates you think about that? 
I know that the California legislature will be voting on whether to include the $7.5 million budget request this later this month. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that $7.5 million goes to, as Angela mentioned, to compensate people who were um, uh, illegally sterilized between 1909 and 1979, as well as those sterilized in prison up, um, up until 2013. That also goes to notify those um, who are who are um, sterilized who may not know to this day, as as you mentioned. Um, in addition to creating some sort of memorial, acknowledging California's eugenics past and um, making amends. And, and then one thing that I would I had wanted to mention just outside of you know what's happening with Kelly and her um, in terms of call to action. Um, that may be like more local um, as well outside of California. Um, you know, it's it's not exactly, um, it's not explicitly stated in the film, but um, mass incarceration um, and keeping communities of color apart physically um, and, and incarcerating women uh, and people, uh, transgender, non-binary and, and men apart from each other is like a de facto type of um, limitation on reproductive rights um, and, and reproductive justice. It's like a um, just preventing uh, women and people from having children during their reproductive years and being able to support their families. So, um, you know, I think anything looking into dismantling, defunding, abolishing prison systems, um, you know, and, and that's, I think, again, something that's more and more um, that uh, work that people are aware of. So, you know, continuing to support um, those movements that are working towards dismantling those systems is, um, is a way to support this work. Yes, thank you, Kristen, for that, because um, I was just going to kind of weigh in and you know, to add to like the importance of rehabilitation versus mass incarceration. Um, we hear stories about um, women who may go, um, who may become imprisoned and, you know, they're pregnant and, you know, they may be forced to have a C-section um, or, or they can't, you know, go into a program so that, you know, they're not forced into a C-section, that they can have a natural birth or some other options for women who are pregnant who come in contact with the criminal justice system. Um, because I think, you know, more rehabilitation versus mass incarceration would support communities um, to one, stay together um, and not have to um, go through these things um, and be filtered through a system that when they become a part of the system, when they become a number that their health and wellness is not neglected just because their life happened to come across with the criminal justice system. So um, thank you for that, Kristen, um, for speaking to that. Um, I think we had a question that came in and someone said, you know, what could reparations really look like? Um, so I wanna pose that back to Erica, Angela and Kristen and the team, you know, what could re reparations look like? I mean, I could take that a little bit as far as like what's been, what has happened in North Carolina. And then Erica, you probably know a little bit more about what Kelly and, and, and uh, Cynthia and, and the coalition is talking about doing here in California. Um, but there has been a template um, as far as this, not necessarily for women and people incarcerated, but um, in North Carolina, there was a reparations bill that was um, passed and people have actually received reparations for um, sterilizations that uh, were um, done forcibly upon them. Um, I believe, um, you know, it was a monetary compensation and a public acknowledgement. Um, I, th I think it was a standard um, across the board type of um, monetary f uh, sum for those people who were, um, uh, and this is the problem with all of these things. It's like, it, they had to be proven to be sterilized within a certain um, 
within a certain time frame. So there were reparations, um, and it was you know a very historic um, and and um, hard fought and hard won thing. And it was you know um, it was great for the people that received those reparations, but there are definitely people who are left out of that process. Um, so you know, as with many of these things, they're not um, they're not flawless. And I, I do think the efforts in North Carolina were incredibly, um, for the most part, I would say that they were um, tried to be as inclusive and, and complete as possible. But it's just a very difficult thing to go back and make sure that everyone who has suffered these injustices um, is, is, um, is compensated or, or receives some kind of acknowledgement. And even then, it's like there's obviously no there's no number no price on on your freedom in this on this freedom on this freedom to be able to to be a parent okay yeah and and also virginia followed suit after north carolina and california we hope could could be the third I think it's also really important to say that we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of the infamous 1927 Supreme Court case, Buck v. Bell, which upheld a statute instituting compulsory sterilization of the unfit um, for the protection and health of the state. And really that set a precedent for states to legally sterilize people in prisons. And despite state federal and international law explicitly banning compulsory sterilizations. This Supreme Court decision has never been overturned. Wow. Thank you for that, Erica. Um, Angela, did you want to mention something? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, well, I can say one thing, um, which is uh, something that Ke Kelly herself has said, you know, kind of one part of this uh, reparations process is she wants to have some kind of a convening, like a get together of other survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important to her. And I think is a real kind of part of her healing process is to be with other survivors like this. So I, you know, that's something that we really hope we can make happen. Yes, I think that would be full of healing for all of the women who experienced this. Um, and it could help other women, uh, whether they're in prison or not, um, just to think about how best they can advocate for themselves um, and even how they can advocate for themselves within a system that does not um, respect them as mm -hmm. human beings. Um, and so I think that's going to be something important. And I think, you know, by Kelly telling her story and other women who tell their stories that can be empowering to other women who, um, within their life, who may come in contact with the criminal justice system. I mean, you know, life happens and, you know, for them to be aware of these things, because we're making them, we're making more women aware of what's going on on the outside, but we need to also make sure that women are equipped with the tools and resources to advocate for themselves within systems that um, don't respect them. Um, so I think that's very, very important. Um, so I know, Erica, you've worked closely with Justice Now. Um, you know, are there other organizations like Justice Now who are doing this work? Um, you know, are they doing other um, programming around this? And, you know, how can other folks get involved? How can civilians get involved with this? Specifically in California, the California Co Coalition for Women in Prison, CCWP, is an incredible organization that is really um, doing this work um, with uh, people inside California's women's uh, prisons. There are so many other organizations across the nation that are also doing critically important work um, around prison reform, prison abolition, um, and really centering um, uh, women and transgender people of color in the conversation about um, criminal justice issues. So I recommend that um, people research specific organizations in their in their communities. 
Thank you. So for our final call to action, what can we do to ensure better health care in prisons? And what, can or, and what organizations can we support? I know you kind of mentioned this to look for um, organizations within our areas, but what can we do to ensure better health care in prison? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think um, this is kind of a, Erica, can we get kind of more specific, but I would say just in a larger way that I think it's really important, you know, as we, as election time it draws near, uh, that we are really mindful of who we are voting into office for both local and federal, uh, for all of the races, uh, and making sure that um, that their interests are sort of aligned with your interests. Uh, so that's kind of a bigger picture thing uh, that I would say, and I, I I'm always on my soapbox about kind of the city council races and the smaller races. People always ignore those and forget those. And those are the races that really play a role in day-to-day -day life. So I, I would just kind of throw that out there. Um, and I, you know, one thing that gave me hope is, as we all know, Kamala Harris was uh, announced as the VP uh, candidate with Biden. And, you know, she, um, she has been pushing this uterine fibroids research and education act. And that was really kind of hopeful for me because um, I'm someone who had fibroids and, um, and uh, as you know, most black women do. And to have someone who is sort of advocating for black women's health like that publicly and putting like real money behind it shows why it's so important to have more diverse leadership because they are more, you know, she uh, is interested in that and has a has an understanding of how that affects such a large community and can push that forth. So um, that's kind of a broader uh, thought process that I had. Um, but Erica, if you had anything else you wanted to add. I think that that's it. Um... Not much, not much else to add. I think that just it's really important to, to say that we really need to take a critical look at dismantling how our institutions operate and work. Mm -hmm. And um, quality um, health care access to the definition is adequate health care is a basic, legal, human, fundamental right mm -hmm. that is not being, not being, um, it, it's, it's being denied in every single institution across, um, across the country. So as we look at access to healthcare, both inside correctional facilities and outside of correctional facilities, I think it's really important that we keep this, this basic human right to adequate healthcare at the forefront um, of how we view these, these policies. Mm -hmm. Agree. And I just wanted to go back to um, what Angela was mentioning. Um, at the Black Women's Health Imperative, we have um, developed, we are, we, we've developed a policy um, agenda for Black women to vote. Um, we launched it back in 2018. We're now revising it and we will be releasing the 2020 version, um, you know, in the September, early October for black women and women of color to use it as a resource to really hold um, elected officials um, accountable for the health and wellness of black women. Um, and I think, you know, we have a huge focus on reproductive justice in there and some other, you know, chronic conditions and prevention that impact communities of color. So um, we are definitely making that available soon for, um, for black women to use as a resource as you know they're thinking about who they um are putting in these offices at the local level the state level i mean you know we have um a, a scorecard at the end of the um agenda that really helps you kind of shape how you want to ask these candidates or how you assess you know their policies and what they've supported in the past to really arm yourself because I think it's going to be very important for us um, 
in terms of how we advocate for policies and practices that um, center us, that respect us, um, and ensure that we have our basic human rights. So thank you for mentioning that, Angela. Um, and so I think for me, I think that's all the questions that I had for you ladies. I think we're going to look into the um, Q&A box to see um, what uh, some of the attendees are asking. So let me take a look and let's see. Um, so a question came in and it says, what about the allegations of sexual harassment by prison doctors? In your research for the film, did you find out if any of them had Excuse me. Did you find out if any of them have been held accountable? There are many lawsuits um, that you can um, search and find out about um, to the degree that we would want uh, people to be prison doctors to be held accountable. No one has been. There have been investigations by the medical board um, and uh, still allowed to practice. Wow. Wow. Okay. Another question came in. Um, the laws that ban forced sterilizations, are they federal or state by state? So international um, and federal and state law prohibits sterilization for a variety of different reasons international law prohibits sterilization because it denies the basic human coercive sterilization because it denies the basic fundamental human right to family. Federal law prohibits using federal funds to coercively sterilize someone or to sterilize someone in coercive environments. State laws for essentially go even a step further to talk about how state funds cannot be used for coercive sterilizations. Checking to see if there are any other questions that are coming in. While we're waiting to see if any other um, folks have any questions, um, for each of you, Kristen, Angela, and Erica, um, what gives you hope? Um, you know, this film is out, folks have seen it. Um, it will encourage folks to do what they can from where they are. Um, I think it, I think, Erica, to your point about reimagining what um, imprisonment looks like. I think you guys provided a an amazing picture of what that looks like um, and um, through the power of storytelling. So what gives you hope um, in the midst of all of this? I can just say that I got a bit hit of hope when you were talking about like the Black Women's Health Initiative coming out with a, a voter guide, you know, and I think that that's something that not only Black women should be looking at following. It's, um, you know, I look forward to seeing that come out and I will be, you know, checking that out because I think, you know, and so that's one thing I guess that I'm saying that gives me hope. It's like, I'm seeing more and more people, more diversity of people speaking out and advocating for themselves and their points of view. Um, and, you know, to kind of reiterate what Angela said in that way, um, that's what we need. I mean, this is, this is this country, you know, this, we are a diverse country with diverse points of view and diverse needs. And so the more people who are engaged in the process of voting and um, especially right now in this upcoming election, you know, that's going to be what, what keeps, what keeps me going. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing that gives me hope. Yeah, I mean, I think I was, similarly, I feel kind of advocates doing this incredible work and more diverse advocates, it's, um, it's really inspiring. And I think that um, the movement, the sort of defund movement has given me hope just in the sense of uh, us having, us being able to have these radical conversations could not have happened. And it obviously it took um, a very terrible thing, the pandemic for it to end the police killings and just this moment that we're having that's very difficult. It took all of that, but then from it, 
Um, there is a different level of activism and engagement and people imagining the, the world the way they want it to be and not feeling like they have to use the systems that exist as the, you know, the foundation for what that is, being able to kind of go beyond um, what's out there and say, hey, maybe this system isn't working. We can come up with something completely different. And those kinds of conversations, I don't feel like we're happening in the same way. So that makes me hopeful and also allows me to do that similar thinking too. Um, and hopefully from all of this, there will be a huge systemic change. Uh, that's, that's kind of why we're doing the work and uh, why we're made the film and are, you know, are bringing it to as many people as we can. I think um, I would echo everything that has already been said and the tremendous work that, that you're doing at Black Women's Health Imperative is really, um, is, is critical. Um, and really centering back to, I think, uh, what's, what Kelly and Cynthia and um, some of the other people in the film talked about is to be able to have conversations about dismantling our notion of imprisonment, dismantling the prison industrial complex. And those are conversations that are being had right now. It's, it's, that's, in, that's incredibly inspiring and incredibly hopeful that we, that we might be able to reimagine how, how we view crime and punishment in our society. Yeah, and I would like to echo everything that you all said, um, because it definitely um, gives young leaders hope in the work that they're doing. Um, and it and and I think now more than ever, we're seeing how everything intersects. You, you cannot be alive right now and not see the intersectionality within your daily life and what it means um, and where you fit into these systems and where you fit with creating new systems. So I think we all have the opportunity to create the change. Um, we all have the opportunity to lend our voices, our talents to this work. Um, and, you know, just like how you guys have worked together to produce this film, to tell the story of women who may not have been told um, had it not been in this format. So just using all of our talents to really bring things to light, I think that gives me hope. Um, it gives me hope in the work that I do with Black Women's Health Imperative, with working with um, young women um, around reproductive justice and sexual health, giving them the tools to be able to advocate for themselves and for policies and practices that they um, that best fit them. Um, so I think right now more than ever, you know, horrible things are happening, but as we continue to have these conversations about them, I think um, we're able to normalize the change that we need um, and for all of us to be change agents for that. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you all. And um, we have one final question that came in. Did Kelly ever get her happy ending? I don't know that pause was too long. It was just exciting. <laughs> he was talking. It's not. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know. No, uh, no, no. It's just we all. It's just the three person thing. But yeah, the, the pause was so long. People were like, "Oh no!" I, um, <laughs> also, I can be very dramatic sometimes. <laughs> oh no. Um. Well, I mean, you know, uh, the, the reparations bill is part of that, and. Um, so in that element, we're all pushing for that to happen. Um, but, you know, in terms of her personal life, you know, she's, uh, Erica, I forget her exact job. Can you tell me what her job is again? She has a great job and I forget what it yeah. is. Yeah, Kelly, Kelly sits on pretty much every um, board uh, that deals with domestic violence. She's the, um, the Los Angeles commissioner um, for family um, uh, and community services. She is the executive director and founder of the nonprofit Back to the Basics. And um, I mean, is probably like the, she's managing a federal grant for um, domestic violence prevention and gang intervention. I mean, what is Kelly not doing? 
Yeah, and she has a great, you know, relationship with her sons and um, uh, and they're a part of her life. And so, you know, um, yes, but the reparations bill will really, uh, really be that sort of final piece. Yes, I'm happy to hear that for her. And I definitely can't wait to celebrate the reparations bill coming through um, <laughs> and us being able to celebrate that. And I think that that will be really rounds for celebration, especially for her and other women who have experienced this and survived. Um, so I think that's it for our questions. So I want to thank our special guests, Kristen, Angela, and Erica as well as our audience for participating in this call to action conversation. For a recap of the organizations you can support around this topic, visit day one on the Repos website. Please make plans to support Repo Film Festival by purchasing film tickets and attending more of their call to action conversations. You can get full info at repromamafilm.org and don't forget, all ticket sales are donated to reproductive justice advocacy organizations. Thank you and have a great evening.